Hey, good morning, church. It's great to see you. Let's all stand together this morning. It's great to see you. Let's join in a word of prayer together. Well, Lord, we're so thankful to be here in this place, to come and to worship you, to lift up your name as your people, as your children. Would our Father be glorified this morning as we sing your praises. We give you this time in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this. Let our praise. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign that we are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath The same God who's never late 
is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all, for all my days. Oh, yes, I will, because I choose to pray. Glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, cause I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. But nothing can stand against, cause I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Stand against, cause I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Oh, nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will, Lord, for all my days. Yes, I will. One more time. For all my days. Yes, I will. Amen. Amen. All right, good morning, church. Great to be here with you. You guys feel free to take a seat. I'm Pastor Andrew, uh, wanted to say a special welcome to anyone who's new with us today. If this is your first time or you're visiting, we would love to connect with you uh, after service and get you plugged in, answer any questions you may have. If that's you, before you head out onto the patio and either hang out or get going, we would love it if you would hang it right into the Welcome Center and meet us there. We have a welcome gift for you and uh, we'd love to get you connected here at Calvary Monterey. It's real important to do that. So we also know from life group signups that the most underrepresented group of people in groups is couples in their 20s and 30s. So if that's you, we actually have a good amount of spots available so um, you can text find a life group to 41411, find a life group to 41411, or meet us in the Welcome Center. We'd love to get you plugged into a group. Um, really excited to be in life group season. I know it just started this last week. So, But as usual, right now we have a few video announcements. Um, and somehow today I got scheduled to be service host and be in a video announcement. So I just want to rest, you know, put you guys at rest. I don't love watching myself uh, on videos or introducing myself. So uh, anyways, but I do want you to sign up for financial peace. So let's, uh, let's direct our attention to the screen for a moment.
Hey church, it's Pastor Matt. Let's take a look at some things that are happening here at Calvary. Financial Peace University is coming up starting the first Monday in October. Super excited about it. You heard last week in our first announcement about it, just how much this class can impact you personally. But this week, I want you to think right now about uh, how you are managing God's money. Maybe you're doing well, or maybe you think you're doing pretty well, but I still bet that we could find thousands of dollars a year that could be redeployed to those you love, to your long-term financial future, and to the kingdom of God as a result of going through Financial Peace University together. If you've got friends that are struggling with money, most of us do, um, whether they're in our church, another church, whether they're sold out believers in Jesus Christ, or whether they're skeptics, anybody can join. So feel free to invite them. Looking forward to going on this journey towards financial peace with all of you who join me. Parents, I wanna chat with you for a second. We know that today there are so many options for us to stream content for our kids and there's more options coming out every week it seems. But I don't know if you felt like me and my wife at times, it's hard to find things that are safe for our kids to watch when we're cooking dinner or we're cleaning the house or doing whatever. We wanna let you know about a great resource. It's called Right Now Media. And if you are a part of our church, whether you've come here one day or you've been here for a long time, we wanna make this available to you. Think of the Christian Netflix, if you will, but there's a whole section for kids that me and my wife absolutely have loved introducing to our two boys. Our 18 month old loves the content on it. Our six year old loves it. We love what's in the Bible. That's our favorite series. They're learning about the books of the Bible, characters in the Bible. My six year old corrects me on biblical knowledge sometimes, which uh, is tough for me at times, but I'm getting over it. We wanna make this available to you to build up your family, to edify you guys. And uh, it's something that you can watch and not cringe or not wonder, oh man, is this gonna teach them something that I'm gonna have to correct later on? And so if you wanna go to the website, get this information right here, sign up today, right now media, and uh, have it be a blessing for your family. If you have any questions about what we've talked about today, you could always go online to calvary.com slash events or sign up for our Calvary Connection weekly email or check out the Connect card that you should have received on your way in. All right, well, we're gonna get to get back into worshiping the Lord together uh, through song, but first we're gonna receive this morning's tithes and offerings. So if you guys would join me in praying, um, as I say from time to time, we all can give in a lot of different ways, whether it's digital or here in service, but we can all be praying um, for what is received in the stewardship of the tithes and offerings that come in. So would you join me in that? Lord, we thank you for um, all that you instruct us on uh, towards money and finances, rich, poor, uh, being content or discontent, Lord, as it deals with the the money that you've provided for us, but help us to, Lord, see you in that way. Help us to understand that you, um, you have us, Lord, that you provide for us, that you know what we need. And Lord, I pray a special uh, prayer over those that um, are giving uh, towards your kingdom. Um, and I just ask that you'd continue to provide for their faithfulness, Lord, that you would bless them as they give and that the gifts that are received would be stewarded, managed, and deployed well and in line with your kingdom purposes, Lord. So we lift that up to you now. We pray that as we get back into worship, Lord, that um, you would steady our hearts, that you would uh, open us up to you in a special way. And Lord, we pray during this time that um, anyone who is new, um, or just been here a few times, that they would feel zero obligation uh, to give. Um, Lord, but we're just calling on you to um, help us to faithfully steward towards kingdom impact the funds that are received. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you're my living hope. Lord, we thank you for giving us a hope that's alive, not a dead hope that does not exist, but one that is rich and real. And Lord, we thank you for the way that you came in the first place. And we're, Lord, in that place of expectation and hope that you, Lord, will come again and that you will make all things new, that the lion will lie down with the lamb, that there will be a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation that you have prepared, Lord, for your people. We thank you for this incredible hope that you have given to us. Lord, continue to meet us here, we pray. Father, I pray for anyone here today, Lord, that's in need of encouragement in the face of discouragement, Lord, would you uplift their hearts. Father, we pray for anyone here who is battling an illness that is a mystery to them, Lord, would you strengthen them for that fight and heal their bodies. Lord, we pray for anyone here today who is in desperate need for wisdom as they pass through something that has confused them. Give them, Lord, that wisdom. We pray, Father, for those who are in need of protection today. Lord, who need your covering your hand, Lord, to be upon them. We pray that you'd defend your people. Father, we pray for those who are in need today and ask that you would provide for their every need according to your riches and glory. Father, we pray for those who are battling with mental illness and ask, Lord, that you'd strengthen them as they carry the cross that you've put in their lives, Lord God. Walk with them through the valley, we pray. Lord, we just come before you this morning and we're so thankful for the great treasure we have in you. Please, Lord, help us to be more conformed into the image of Christ today as we worship and praise and interact, Lord, with your word. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated, church. Good morning, everyone. Please take out your Bibles this morning. We're in a study right now through the book of First John, also Second and Third John, but right now we're in First John, and today we're in First John chapter two, starting in verse three. If you'd open up to that place in your Bibles, it's near the end of the New Testament, First John chapter two. If you need a Bible, raise your hand in the air, and we'll get one to you. And uh, as you're turning there, I just wanted to make a little bit of a sad announcement for our, our church family. This last week, a woman in our church named Shella Suber, many of you knew her, she was 65 years old and she had a bout with cancer and this last week she went home to be with Jesus. Uh, some of you may have known her, she was a greeter at the front door um, at the nine o'clock service and just a real sweet woman and leaves behind a family who are, of course is mourning uh, her loss and uh, we, or their loss, and we just want to pray for them this morning, pray for the family. Uh, we're going to have a service for Shella at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning right here in the sanctuary. So if you knew her, or even if you didn't know her, but you would like to show that Christian support, please come. You're free to come 11 o'clock uh, on Tuesday morning for Shella Suber. But she was a great woman, and we just want to lift up the Suber family to the Lord, and then also I'll pray for our time in Scripture this morning as well. So, Father, we do. We come before you and we pray for the Suber family, so many of them here at the 9 o'clock service today. And we pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, that you'd comfort, Lord, their hearts, 
as they go through this time of loss, Lord, and as they deal with grief in their different ways, we pray, Lord, that the comfort of your Holy Spirit would be present in their lives. We pray that your word would be a strong consolation to them, and especially, Lord, just the hope and the confidence of where Shella is, Lord, today in glory, rejoicing and celebrating in and with you. And so we thank you, Lord, for that incredible truth. But let your hand, Lord, be upon her family, Lord, who is still here walking on earth. And Lord, we also pray for our time in your word today from 1 John chapter 2. Let it be, Lord, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Let it inform, Lord, the way that we live life today. We pray that you would do this, Lord, and only you can do it, Lord, by the power of your spirit. But without you, our hearts are are hard. Without you, we have no ability. But with you, Lord, all things are possible. And we believe, Lord, that you can shape us and change us to become more and more like Jesus as the years tick by. So, Lord, would you do that in our lives? We pray together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the symptoms of a sickness or read of the symptoms of a sickness and have convinced yourself that you had that sickness only to find later in the hands of a real medical professional that it was all a figment of your imagination. Anybody ever been there before? You know, you did a little WebMD research and you started thinking to yourself like, I think I have leprosy, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) I think that John, in writing this letter, has come to a place in chapter two, verse three, where he's concerned that the symptoms that he's been talking about, people who have said that they were walking in the light, though they were walking in darkness, people who said they had no sin problem within, though they had many sins to confess, and people who said that they were not guilty of any sin, though they needed to utilize Jesus as their advocate to help them with sin. I think John was starting to think that maybe his readers, people in the church, people who loved Christ, that they were starting to think maybe John is talking about us. Maybe we're the ones who are walking in darkness. Maybe we're the ones who have a sin problem that is unadmitted and undealt with. And so John is going to do something both here and also throughout the entirety of this particular letter that is for the believers. What he's going to do is he's going to give them three tests to help them discern whether they are part of God's family or not. All right, the three tests are these. Number one, he's going to give them a moral test. Basically, the question there is going to be, am I obedient generally to God as he speaks to me in his word? Do I obey the commandments of God? That's one evidence that John is going to hold out. A second evidence that John is going to look at in this passage, but also throughout the entirety of the letter, is a social test. Do I love God's people? Is that present in my life? Do I care about the people in my church community? Do I love other Christians? And then a third test that John is going to hold out, and we won't read of this one today, but it'll be in future sections, is a doctrinal test. Do I believe in the real, true Jesus Christ? And in one way or another, the rest of 1 John is dealing with one of those three questions from this point forward. He's going to introduce those questions, talk about those questions, revisit those questions, re-educate about those questions, and continue to bring his readers back into a place of saying, am I obeying God's word? Am I loving God's people? And do I believe in the real, true, legitimate Jesus, or am I being swayed from him and who he really is as revealed in Scripture? All right, so today we're going to look, really, for the most part, at the first two tests. Do I uh, obey God's word, and do I love God's people? So let's read this first test, starting in verse 3. We'll just go all the way. We're going to go through verse 11 this morning. He says, and by this, verse 3, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. 
So John here gives this test. Throughout the letter, he's going to use this little phrase that he uses in verse 3. And by this, we know. So only John could write this. Only an apostle could say something like this. He's saying, here's the test to help you know whether you really actually know the Lord, whether you're really actually in him. Now, before we move on to see what he says about knowing the Lord, I think we just need to pause for a second And think about how radical and incredible it is that we actually have the capability of knowing God. I mean, this is something I think we just say from time to time. Like, I have a relationship with God. I I, I know God. I talk to God. Sometimes forgetting who it is that we're actually speaking about when we say that we know the living God. I'm going to read you a few things that the Bible teaches about God. God teaches, or the, the Bible teaches that God is pure actuality. This means that he is pure existence with no possibility of change or any possibility of being anything other than what he is. That's not true of you and me, but that's God. He is pure actuality. God is indivisible. He's incapable of being divided. If you took one of his attributes away from him, he would cease to be God. It would all crumble. He is everything perfectly. God is self-existent. He's the one who brought into and sustains everything else that exists. And because of that, God is essential. For his non-existence is impossible. Did, Did you understand that? The world, if you'd never been born, would have kept on ticking. But not so if God did not exist. He is essential. He is eternal, which means that for him, there is the absence of successive moments. Have you ever thought of that? That for God, it's not like he's just watching everything unfold, you know, like, oh, what's going to happen today? For him, it's all there in front of him because he's eternal. God is unchangeable. For his perfection mandates that he not change. God has unchangeable feelings because his feelings are rooted in his nature, not in us or circumstances. God is immaterial, which means that he's spirit. God is immense, meaning he cannot be measured. God is omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. God is omnipresent, omniscient, majestic, immortal, triune, and one. And he's holy and righteous and just and loving and kind, and he's jealous for you and for me. This is who God is. Just a little bit that scripture teaches us about God and John just throws it out there. By this, we know that we know him. I mean, it's just amazing that you and I have the possibility of knowing this creature, this being, this majestic and holy God. But we can know him. We can know him because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I hope you want to know him. I hope you want to experience him. I hope you want to have that kind of relationship with this God. Now, John, when he says that he knew God, when when he says that we know God, in his mind, he's not just thinking, I know the list. I know the list that Nate just read. I know all these doctrines about God. I know all these things about God. No, he'd, he'd witnessed Jesus. He'd watched his life. He didn't have to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John like we do to learn about Jesus. He'd watched it all unfold. He'd seen the way Jesus would hear a man who said, Lord, cleanse me of my leprosy, and that Jesus would go and extend his hand and touch the leper and heal him. I'm sure John, when he saw things like that, thought to himself, I don't know that I would ever do that. But look at Jesus. Look at the way that he speaks. Look at the way that he teaches. Look at the way that he takes the intelligentsia of his day and looks them in the eye and tells them that they are wrong about God, that they don't know the truth. Look at the way he loves and cares and the miracles he performs. You see, John, he knows the Lord. He has seen the Lord. But John did not just know Jesus in that way. He had known Jesus through the pain in his own life. He'd seen victories. He'd seen Peter preach the gospel and 3,000 get saved in one moment. He'd seen people healed of illnesses. He'd seen the gospel advance to the ends of the earth. But he'd also experienced imprisonments. He'd also experienced beatings for being an apostle. And did you remember this? The first apostle to ever die for their faith was John's older brother, James. He'd been heartbroken. But through all of that, he'd experienced and he had known God. And so he just says, brothers and sisters, this is the deal. We can know him. We can know him. But he says, by this we know that we know him. Here's the test, he says in verse 3, if we keep 
his commandments. If we keep his commandments. To John, this is the way that it worked. He thought, if you really, truly know God, then here will be the evidence in your life. You will be a person who seeks to keep the commandments of God. You'll want to obey the Lord with your life. Now, I say it specifically that way because sometimes people get the cart before the horse. The Pharisees were like this. They thought, if we obey God, then we can know God. But that's not what John is saying. In John's mind, he's already said God is light. To him, it's like God has shown his light upon a human heart, opened up our minds to who God is, helped us see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, helped us believe in Jesus and trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins. And then, after all of that light has shown, we say, I want to respond by being obedient to the commandments of the Lord. This is always the order that the New Testament teaches. You might remember Saul, who became Paul the Apostle. He's a good example of this. He was in rebellion against God. He was a Pharisee. He hated Christians. He was throwing them into prison and persecuting them. But a moment came in his life where he was on a road to Damascus with letters in his hand that gave him permission to persecute Christians in the city of Damascus. And as he was on his journey, a bright light shone from heaven and knocked him to the ground. The people that were with him, they heard the voice that Paul heard, but they could not hear it intelligibly. They didn't know the words that were spoken. It was like thunder to them. But Paul heard the Lord. And Paul said to him, well, the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And, and Saul said, who are you, Lord? It, it was a word of submission, like you're the Lord. Who, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And you see, at that moment, the light shone upon this man, and he lived the rest of his life after that moment in submission to the Lord, trying to obey what God had asked him to do. It begins with the light, and then we respond. But that's the way that it works. Notice, though, that John doesn't say, by this we know that we have come to know him if we've had a religious experience. He doesn't say, by this we know that we've come to know him if we can remember a moment where we had these crazy warm fuzzies. He doesn't say, by this we know that we know him if there was a time during worship at this one conference we were at where all of a sudden we started crying and emotion was present in there. None of those things are invalid, but John isn't thinking about a religious experience. He's looking into a human life and saying, do I see the fruit of obedience coming out of their lives? James said in James chapter 1, verse 22, that we must be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Now, when John says this, it's important for us to remember the context. He's already admitted that our obedience to the Lord is not going to be perfect. There are going to be times that we fail. In fact, I, I hope last week many of you were encouraged when I got to chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, where Paul, or excuse me, John said, look, brothers, sisters, I'm writing to you so that you may not sin. It kind of felt a little like, oh man, that's a big deal, like I could not sin, I could have victory. But then he said, but if anyone does sin, anybody underline that last week? You're like, oh, that's me. I'm on that team, the but if anyone does sin team. You see, John isn't saying that we'll follow the Lord perfectly, but generally, that there will be a thing in our hearts where we say, I want to keep his commandments. Now let's go on in the passage and see what he says next. In verse four, he says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Now in verse four, he starts out the sentence with the phrase, whoever says. Remember last week, he, sa he said three times, if we say, and he had three different times of saying, if we say. Here today, we're gonna see three different times that he says, whoever says. So these people are making a claim. And in this first instance, we see that this person does not keep his word. They say, I know him, but they don't keep his commandments. And John calls this person a liar. He says the truth is not in this person. You know, they're talking and acting as if they know God, but the reality is that their lives are out of step with the Lord. Now, unfortunately, we live in an era and in a time and in a society where this is not a difficult thing to imagine. 
It's not hard to imagine someone saying, professing with their lips, oh yeah, I know the Lord. I know God. We're tight. We're close. You know, I pray. I talk to him. We're friends, you know. But at the same time, live a life that betrays that they do not actually know him because they're so far from keeping his commandments. Our world is filled with people who make religious claims about their knowledge and relationship with God, but who are walking and living so far from the truth. Even this last week, there was a star player in the NFL who was accused in his past of a repeated rape against a woman that he had known. And it came to light. And of course, he hasn't stood trial. He's innocent until proven guilty, and the courts will you know, have their day and have their say, we assume. But in the process, he announced, well, hey, the thing was, our relationship was consensual the entire time. And as you go on to read the story, what you discover is that they met at a Bible study while they were in college together. You see, this little Bible study where we're naming the name of Christ, we're talking like Christians, acting like Christians, and then he just announces, but we had a consensual relationship together. Not understanding You're disobeying God even with that in and of itself. And over and over again, we're surrounded by this type of hypocrisy. Musicians who praise God at the Grammys for albums and songs that are sexually explicit or violent in nature. Actors who thank God for their third or fourth spouse. Politicians who pronounce God bless America while overseeing the systematic slaughter of innocence in the womb or worship leaders and pastors who sing and speak in spiritual tones only to deny the Lord in their private lives. Unfortunately, this thing that John points out, it happens. And we understand that it happens. It saddens us that this hypocrisy is an actual thing. But John tells us there's another way. Look at verse five again. He said, whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. You see, the believer has gone through a change of mind. They've decided that the word is a word that he uses, the truth, another word John uses, and the commandments of God, another word that John uses, that they are what we need to navigate life. To be in Christ leads to a revolution of the mind. It it means that the way I used to decide to do things, it's, it's no longer working. I want you to imagine in your mind uh, someone out on the ocean, a captain with a, with a ship. I, I'm, I'm not like, a, I don't like going on the ocean. I, I get seasick really badly, so I could totally botch this illustration. But just imagine a captain of a ship out at sea, and uh, a moment comes where all his navigational instruments, they all break. And he quickly realizes they're unreliable. I can't lean on them. I can't trust them to get me north, south, east, or west. I I can't use them to get to my desired destination. What I've been told is that what what he will do is rely on his previous training and begin to look to the stars. We'll begin to, to, to realize, I can't trust these. I must look to the heavens. And the reality for the Christian is that the Christian has come to a place where they recognize Look, the, the, the navigational equipment that I built before Jesus, through my personal experiences, through my own opinion, through the teaching of the world, the influence of culture and society, through sins that were committed against me, the grid that I built to help me navigate life, it does not work. I instead have to look into the word to figure out how to do and how to live life. That's what John is saying. He's saying for this person, it's like the love of God has been perfected inside of them. They've realized, number one, how much God loves them. Secondly, they have matured in their love for God. They've said, I'll obey you no matter what. And thirdly, God's love has begun to flow through their lives to other people. And so he says, look, the commandments, that's what we're to be about. This person that lives that way, The love of God has been perfected inside of them. Now let's go on in verse 6 and see the specific commandment that the Lord wants us to adhere to. Remember I told you the first test is that uh, the question of do I I know God? Am I I loving God? 
And the second one is, am I loving his people? So here it is in verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Whoever says, the second whoever, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now he's talking about Jesus there. That's an intimidating thing, don't you think? To be told that if I abide in the Lord, I'm going to walk in the same way that Jesus walked. You see, a lot of people like to take Jesus, I think they like to turn him and twist him into their, their own thing. You know, kind of kind of hijack Jesus and put him onto their team. And this person is doing that, whoever says. They're, they're saying, I abide in him, but they're taking Jesus and twisting him to be their, their own thing. And in, in our era, this happens a lot. You know, Jesus is jammed into every box that people can contrive. You know, we like to refashion him. So you've got Republican Jesus. You've got Democrat Jesus. You've got gay Jesus or gun-toting Jesus. You've got truth-spitting Jesus and angry Jesus or open-border Jesus or closed-border Jesus or racist Jesus or envi- environmentally aware Jesus. We constantly like to change him and twist him and shove him into our box. Did I make everybody mad today? <laughs> You can email Jeff at calvary.com. <laughs> but the thing is, I like the real Jesus. I like the OG Jesus. I like the original Jesus. I like the Jesus who is the second person of the triune Godhead, who conspired within himself in seeing the brokenness of humanity from the foundation of the world to say, I will go for them. I will become one of them. I'll become one of them and live a perfect and sinless life as one of them so that I can sacrifice myself for them. I will shed my blood so that they can be forgiven of their sin. I like the Jesus who then rose from the dead proving that his sacrifice was sufficient for the saving of our souls. And I like the Jesus who then ascended to the right hand of the Father and when he did, poured out his Holy Spirit and made a new humanity called the church, the ecclesia, to dwell and live here on earth in the world yet not of it. I like that Jesus who promised that just as he came once, he's coming again. And I'm praying for his return. You see, people like to take Jesus and make him whatever they want him to be, but this is the real Jesus that John is talking about. And he tells us, that we're to walk, if we, if we really are abiding in, in God, if we're really continuing with him, we're to walk as Jesus walked. Now, it's one thing if I say it. You know, I, like I said earlier, I have to read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. I have to read about Jesus' life. I have to put the details together. I have to imagine them in my mind. And we're going to do some imagining as a church in the next year because I'm going to teach the book of Matthew starting out next year. And we're going to think about Jesus and who he is. But John, like I said earlier, had that front row seat. He had watched Jesus. He had seen Jesus do impossible things. And here he is saying, we got to walk like Jesus walked. I mean, for goodness sake. John was in the boat when Jesus walked on the water. And here he says, we must walk like Jesus walked. What does he mean? Does he mean that we need to walk on water, that we need to do miracles, that we need to have that kind of power in our lives? No, in the context, that's not at all what John is talking about. He's not saying we need to walk on water. He's saying we need to walk in love just like Jesus. You see, that was Jesus' style. He loved the people that were around him. He served them and cared for them. You might remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, his last night with his disciples, There came a moment, and John gives commentary to it. He says, Jesus knew full well where he'd come from, God's presence, God's throne room, and where he was going, back into the presence of his Father in heaven. But with that knowledge, he took up his garments, tied them around his waist, took a bowl, filled it with water, and began to wash his disciples' feet. It was the task of the lowest slave in the house. When he came to Peter, Peter objected. You can't wash my feet. You know, you're my Lord. You're my master. You can't wash my feet. But Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me, and I have no part with you. And then he said it this way. Look at the screen. John 13, verse 14 and 15. He said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. You see, the way of Jesus is loving the people of God, serving the people of God. A lot of people think they're really advanced in the Christian life. And I've met some people who think they're so advanced in the Christian life who won't lift a finger for another Christian. They're not advanced at all. Jesus girded himself, lowered himself to serve us. John said in verse 7, to continue on in this passage in 1 John chapter 2, he said, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. You see, John announces this whole thing of loving like Jesus, walking like Jesus. It's not a new commandment. He tells his readers, he's like, it's an old commandment. You've heard it from the very beginning. Now, if you go into into the Old Testament, you'll discover that love for God, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and love for our neighbor, Leviticus chapter 19, these are things that God had taught. We're to love God, we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. They're not things that Jesus invented or that Jesus started. They were there from the very beginning. These were old commandments. You look all the way back in the Old Testament and you see we are to love for and care for other people. It's a Bible basic. But John also says not only is it a Bible basic, it's a, it's a Christian basic. That's why he says in verse 7, you've heard it from the beginning. I mean, if you think about it, the idea that we should love other believers, it's embedded into the message of the gospel itself. Because you see, the gospel doesn't say God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son, but that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So when we are offered salvation, it's a, it's a salvation that's being offered to every human being on the face of the earth. And when we receive it individually, we recognize almost intuitively, but there are other people that God loves. It's not just for me. When I pray, I'm to pray, as Jesus said, our Father, not my Father, but our Father in heaven is what Jesus said. The idea of the gospel has embedded within it that God is a respecter of no person. There's no tribe, nation, tongue, gender that he doesn't want to reach. He cares for the whole world. It's a Christian basic. It it, it goes to the very beginning of when we first heard the gospel. But notice what John continues to say in verse 8. He says, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So on the one hand, John said, look, this whole thing, the love, it's an old commandment. We've known it from the very beginning of our Christian lives. We've known it as we go back and read the Old Testament scripture. But at the same time, there is something new about it. Listen to how Jesus said it in John 13, verse 34. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. You see, for Jesus, he's he's saying this is, at the same time it's, it's being old, it is also a new commandment. How did Jesus make love into a new commandment for us? I think on one hand, Jesus put a new emphasis on love. You know, the, the, the people that were around in Jesus' day, it's not like they wouldn't have known the scriptures that talked about love in the Old Testament era, but they were just kind of buried. They were just kind of hidden. It was like, okay, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we should be about. But, but Jesus gave love a place of prominence. It's like, it's like he put it on the marquee. It's like in his mind he said, this is the thing that if you can get this one, you're going to get all the others. You know, it's, it's the one that if it becomes a major part of your view of the world and the way that you live life, then, then all the other things that I ask you to do, you're going to have an easier time doing those things because it will flow from an attitude, from a heart of love. But Jesus also, man, he just made love more radical. I mean, I don't know if you've ever read Matthew chapter 5 and just been shocked at what you find there. He, he tells people to pray for their enemies and those who persecute them. He tells people who are being compelled to go travel one mile by Roman soldiers to instead go two miles. He tells people who are hit or beaten to turn the other cheek. He just made it into a 
more radical thing than they had previously understood. They were in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth kind of culture, and Jesus blew that culture out of the water and said, no, I want to show you how radical this love is supposed to be. And Jesus put a new target to love. I mean, one day, one of them made a mistake of asking Jesus, hey, Lord, who is my neighbor? You know, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? They had a real tight definition of that, you know, like 15 feet, that's it, you know, or so, I don't know what it was, but it was a real tight definition. But Jesus opened up the definition by telling them the story, the the parable of the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, talking about a man who reached beyond racial borders, a man who found someone who was downcast and hurting and extended himself for a great period of time to help this man come back into wholeness. Jesus also gave a new depth to love. The whole world, Jesus said. God so loved the whole world. And I think that by the power of Jesus, he made possible for love to always be fresh, so therefore always new. I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you're just having a bad attitude about something, a bad attitude about someone else, and the Spirit of God by himself whispers into your heart, you need to love them. You need to extend yourself right now to them. It's like, it's not that you're drawing up like this old commandment, like I remember hearing on the first day of my Christian life that I need to love people. It's like the Spirit of God is teaching it to you afresh right in that moment. But here's the other thing that Jesus did to make love new. He made a new epoch of love. Now I realize that's a weird thing that I just said right there. So let me explain this weird thing that I just said. Look at verse 8 with me. At the end of it, he says, The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Now let me explain to you. Before Jesus came, the people of Israel They were waiting for the age to come. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Christ. They were waiting for this messianic age to start. Now, as Christians, in a sense, we are still very much waiting for the age to come. We are waiting for the moment where there will be no more darkness, where we'll be in the new creation, where we will be in God's presence forever. But when Jesus came he introduced a new epoch in the sense that the one that was to come, the age that was to come, it came. And though it's not fully here, it has already begun in a sense. And in what sense has it already begun? Well, it's already begun, at least in part, in the kind of love that Jesus announced to us. You see, Right now, the big three Christian attributes or characteristics are faith, hope, and love. That's what the Bible teaches. You need to have faith, you need to have hope in his return, that kind of confidence, hope in what he's going to do, and you need to have love for God and for others. But the thing is, when the epoch that has come now is fully here, you won't need faith anymore, and you won't need love anymore. It's not going to take faith in heaven to be like, I, I, really, I, I believe that God is here. I believe that he's real. She's just going to like be basking in the glow of God himself. And you know, people around you are going to be like, what are you talking about? Faith that God is here. Like he's right there. You know, (laughs) it takes no faith, takes no hope to be like, "I, I believe that he's coming. He'll have already come. But what will continue and what has already begun is love. That epoch began with Jesus and it will continue for all of eternity. The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. All right, so this is John's way of making a really big deal about this second test. Do I love my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus? All right, before I move on to the last three verses for our morning, which is just kind of a conclusion from John, I want to just talk about this subject of Christian love for a second, and have some practical considerations about it. Because I think it's really easy for us to say like, yeah, 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 I love people. (laughs) Yeah, 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 I love, you know, the people in my church. I don't know them. 
but I love them, you know, <laughs> like, just as long as I don't know them, I can love them, as, as long as, 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 like, I'm disconnected from them, as long as, like, when the service gets out, I can get to my car as quickly as possible, and not be in a life group, and not ever know them, I will love them then, and I know once that stops, and I get to know them, it would be really hard to love them, so I just want to keep things the way they are, and we, we can say all day long that we have an attitude, or a mood, a feeling of love, but that's not what John's talking about, he's talking about a real life of love, so I want to talk about this for a second. Because for me, Christian love, loving other Christians, it was a thing that took me out of living life like a self-centered zombie to having real meaning, real purpose, real fire, real love in life. And it's never gone away for me in these last 22 years, but that's not to say it hasn't been difficult. Christian love is, I think, the hardest thing that I've ever done. It can be painful, it can be awkward, it can be difficult. And I wanted to share with you just a couple of lessons that I've learned about Christian love because I have a real heart to de-romanticize this whole thing. You know, where we get the idea that like I'm gonna get into a life group and we're gonna like lock arms and there's gonna be the bonfire in the middle and we're just gonna be like singing hallelujah over and over again or kumbaya or whatever and like all my deepest fears, are, they're gonna love me and accept me and it's just gonna be this beautiful time together one thing you have to understand is that when you love other Christians, there will be times, I wanted to say this, that you will be disappointed. You will be disappointed. You know, because we have sin. You're not dealing with perfect, glorified people. You're dealing with people that are still in the sanctification process like you are. So there will be times that you're betrayed like Jesus was betrayed, denied like Jesus was denied where favoritism takes place, you know, you're going to experience things like that. You'll experience real, tangible disappointments. You'll also experience stretching. You see, if you just are with people that are just like you all the time, you're not really stretched, but when you hang out with people from other generations, love people from other generations, other socioeconomic backgrounds, when you love people from other cultures and races, when you love people who are unlike you, it stretches you. It helps you see some of your own limitations. And it, it's good for you, but it's stretching. And, and love for other believers, another thing it will do is it, it might just reveal you. You, know, you think you're all spiritual, and then you get in a room where you're trying to serve other people, and you start realizing your own flesh, your own weaknesses. You sign up for a ministry, you're like, yeah, that felt good to like sign up. Yeah, like signing up for it always feels good. The signing up, it's, but then when the moment comes where you have to go, <laughs> you, have to, you have to show up early, you have to do something hard, your television's going to be calling, you know, saying like, please stay, hang out with me, spend time in my presence. You know, it, it will be difficult. It will reveal who you are, your weaknesses. And loving other believers, here's another thing I've learned, it will make you tired. It will fatigue you. There was a time in Jesus' life where they didn't even have a chance to eat food. They were so busy loving other people. Jesus said to his disciples, let's get away for a little while and be alone. They tried, and that's when the 5,000 followed, and Jesus had to feed the 5,000. It didn't work. They didn't get the break they were looking for. Some people try to get all mystical about the story where Jesus was in the boat with the disciples, huge storm, so big that it freaked out seasoned fishermen from the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was asleep in the stern of the boat, and some people try to figure it out, like, what does that mean? What is going on? How was he asleep? I, he was asleep because he was tired. <laughs> He was so tired from loving people, helping people, ministering to people. It just took the energy out of him. It fatigued his life. So you got to be ready for that. Disappointment, stretching, revealing, fatigue. I say these things because too many people, they've let disillusionment about other Christians take this part of the Christian life out of, out of circulation in their own lives. They've, they've removed themselves from the opportunity to love other believers because they've been hurt. I remember when I was a little boy, and baseball was different back then. Nowadays, you know, they start out a t-ball, and the balls are squishy, and then they move up to coach pitch, where the coach is throwing perfect strikes, or a little machine is throwing perfect strikes. But in my day, we played with hard baseballs the whole time, and you went straight from t-ball into other little kids like you, like little maniacs trying to figure out how to throw a strike. 
And you'd stand up there to play, and some kids threw hard, others didn't, but you just knew, like, I'm going to get hit. And the moment would come in every baseball player's life where they got hit by a baseball that very first time. And when that happened, you stood there, and you had a decision to make. Am I going to still play this game? <laughs> like, if this is what happens, if this is what occurs, will I still play this game? And am I willing to deal with it? And so many Christians, they get hurt, they get hit. And man, I tell you what, I've hurt a lot of people in the body of Christ in my time. And I've been hurt by a lot of Christians in my time. And you have to make a decision that even when you get plunked, you're going to stay in the game. That you're going to continue on in Christian charity and love. John had this. John had suffered immensely at the hands of even Christians, but he kept on moving in his desire to love other believers. Right now, after saying all of that, some of you might be sitting there saying to yourself, like, man, Nate, you made it sound terrible. <laughs> Why would I want to do this? Why would I want to extend myself? Why would I want to spend my life loving others? Well, John has an answer to that question in the last three verses of our passage this morning. So let's read it together. He says, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there's no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness, is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm not going to get very detailed into those three verses, but what I want you to notice is that it's like in John's mind, there's a tale of two men. There's no middle ground. There's the person that has chosen to say that they're a believer, but actually in all practical and for, for all intents and purposes, they are hating their fellow brother and sister in Christ. And then the person who actually is, loves God and is loving their fellow brother and sister in Christ. And he paints a picture of the outcome of both of their lives. The person who chooses hate, chooses that darkness, chooses not to extend themselves in love, he says this person, the way he describes him is, he walks in darkness, he does not know where he is going, he is blind. In other words, it's like he enters into this path of darkness and all he gets is more darkness. It just perpetuates you can imagine a person like this early on in life saying, life is about me. I'm going to spend it on myself. I'm not going to spend it on others. Life is about me. And then fast forward three, four, five, six decades into the future, and there they are, alone, dying, not having made an impact, not having blessed generations behind them, spending it on the self. All they got was more darkness, John is saying. But the second path, there's the one where a person says, I love God. His light has shone upon my heart, and he's shown me that I need to love other people, and I'm going to obey him in that. And they enter onto that path, and what they get is more light. It started with light, but they just get more and more light. There's no cause for stumbling in that person, John says. They're not tripping themselves up. They see themselves accurately. They're not self-deceived, but they also see other people the way that God wants them to be seen. And that life, that life of love, Man, it just gets better and better and better as the years go by. Their heart is healthy. They're clean within. So I think John has stated a good case for us. And I want to live that life of love, that life in the light of God. All right. I hope that you desire that. I hope you want that. I want to close by giving to you some applications of this passage. Okay, I'll put them on the screen for you. I'll run through them real quick. But here's seven applications of this text. There's many more, but here's seven to, to, for you to consider. Number one, let John's test have access to your life. Let John's test have access to your life. Don't let it be just a thing of, I had an experience. I had a religious, you know, kind of moment. It was a spiritual moment. Boom, test is passed. That's not the test that's held out by John. John says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So let that test into your life. Number two, spend time studying the implications of the cross of Jesus Christ. If part of this is being perfected in love, having our eyes open to his love, then we should think about the cross and what it actually does. 
So online where I put these notes uh, at nateholdridge.com, I actually gave you a couple resources that you could check out. One is a book by John Stott called The Cross of Christ. So I told you to think about The Cross of Christ. It's a great book about the cross of Christ. And then I also put a bunch of articles that I've written about the cross of Christ uh, over the years that also might help you. A little bit less reading than John Stott's book. Number three, study the attributes of God. If we're talking about knowing him, then it is good for us to spend time thinking about his attributes, what they are. I rattled off a bunch of them earlier in the teaching today, but it'd be good for us to study these attributes. Number four, put a spine back in the word love. It's a tough word. It's an active word. It's a strong word. It's not a sentimental, sappy, limp word. It's a strong word. And I want you to see it that way. Think about the love of Jesus. That will help you think about how strong love really is. Number five, get back into Christian service. This isn't for everybody today, but I'm sure there are some of you today who because you had some bad experiences in serving the Lord, but really serving other people, and you had some bad experiences, you withdrew from using your gifts, you withdrew from expending your life and energy for the kingdom of God. But I'd encourage you to get back into Christian service. If, if you're spiritually healthy, it's a good place for you to be in. Number six, find an encourager. Now, I'd like to qualify this for a second, what I mean by finding an encourager. There are, there's a certain type of encourager that's a dime a dozen. And, and this encourager, what, what they are is when you go to them and you tell them what you're going through, what you're feeling, and what you'd like to do, they just generally say like, yeah, you should do that. That kind of, they're all over the place. They're terrible. They won't tell you the truth. They just want to know like, what are you going to be happy with? And I'll tell you that. What I'm saying is look for encouragers who when you're discouraged about loving other believers, they will encourage you to keep going. Okay? Find encouragers like that, co-laborers in Christ that you can look to to say, man, we're going to keep doing this. And then number seven, this one's kind of freaky, but number seven, write your obituary. I did this as an exercise recently where I spent some time writing Nate Holdridge's obituary. It wasn't a like how I died, you know, kind of obituary, but it was like what I left behind. What kind of impact was there? The reason why I think this could be helpful for some of you is it puts in perspective what life is really all about. I think if you do this, what you'll discover is how right John was, that it really does come down to loving other people and the impact you make in other people's lives. All right, a little side bonus Word of advice, if you do this and you're married, don't then give it to your spouse to read your obituary. It's a really sad experience for them, and I learned this from personal uh, <laughs> trial and error. <laughs> so just keep it to yourself or show it to your friends because they're cool with the fact that you're going to die someday. <laughs> All right, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us love each other. Lord, we pray that you would do this in our lives. We want to love others. We want to love as you've loved us. But we feel the weakness, Lord. We feel how hard and difficult it is for us at times to, to do this. So Lord, please, grow and expand us. And Lord, as we stretch ourselves into this, we pray that your power, your might would meet us and that you would help us to do the thing that feels impossible. Thank you, Lord. Let our lives be spent loving others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand, church, and sing this last song to the Lord. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. So oh, I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. So I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. 
he can't stand against. But yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will, Lord, for all my days. Yes, I sing it out. For all my days. Yes, we will. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next week.